Well, we're continuing this series, uh, this challenge. Hopefully you felt challenged. Again, I say it every week, um, that this just hasn't been another series for you. Um, some of you may not like challenge because it, uh, it gets you uncomfortable a little bit. And, and I've kind of uh, noticed that a little bit in talking to some people, that when people are challenged, it gets a little bit uncomfortable. And so uh, we talked a little bit about it last week that, uh, that, you know, man, the enemy doesn't want you to be uncomfortable. The enemy wants you to just be comfortable in your church setting. Because when you start feeling challenged and uncomfortable, he knows that good things are beginning to happen. We've uh, been building on, these last few weeks, building on some callings in your life. And you can call them other things if you like. Calling on, or maybe calling them purposes. Uh, maybe calling them reasons for your life. Maybe calling them assignments, you know, hey, I'm young, I'm only 13, 14, 15, does God really want me or call me to do anything? Or, oh, I'm older, or I'm in middle age now, is God really wanting me to do anything? Does He have any purpose or reason for me, or am I just same thing every day? That's what we sing to my kids sometimes, same thing every day. I used to sing that to Trey when he started crying while I'm changing his diaper. Same thing every day, same thing, you know, and we would fall into that, right? We fall into that, maybe because we hear it as uh, young babies. I don't know. But listen, what we're saying here is that, you know, it's tough. It's tough. We, I totally understand that it's tough to get out of the normal routine. But for God to do something with this and for, for us to hear what God is purposing for us, we've got to get out of that. We've got to figure it out. Well, we've been building on those. Remember, first week we said, you know, we have to understand that God loves us. That you sitting right there were loved by God first. That he loved us first and then said, hey, what's the response now? For I love the world. And you understand with that love becomes, in the second week, belonging to something. Every one of you did not want to sit at the lunch table by yourself. You want to be joined. You want to be a part of something. You want to belong to something. And God said, listen, you're loved. I love you. But it's not just you and me. There's others too. And you belong to a church family. You belong to a family of God. I'm praying that you as a pastor that you're finding that. And then last week we talked about how you are, God is, is, is making you into something. You are becoming something. If you believe those first two and you can get over those, you're like, yeah, man, he loves me. And I, be I do belong to something. I'm looking around. Yeah, I'm a part of something. But God, what are, you, what are you doing with my life? Are you making me into something? Am I becoming something? Can I find my identity with you? And we talked about how that is one of the callings for you to understand that you are to become like Jesus Christ. Well, this week we build on those. And we build on the call to be a blessing. Now you say, how do I bless others? How do I bless people? What do I do? If you say I'm called to bless, how do I do that? Well, you do it by serving a need for someone. You're called to do that. It's the same when you had salvation. You were up here, maybe you were somewhere, wherever you were being baptized. You came out of that water to serve. You didn't just come out of that water with a salvation experience to just feel good about yourself for the rest of your Christian journey. You came out ready to serve. Those two go hand in hand. But how do I bless others? Is that, is that with physical assistance? Is it with emotional support? Is it with financial help? Is it with practical advice? Is it with scriptural advice? Is it with just giving somebody a cup of water? Yes, 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 and yes. The Bible, when it talks about it, says when we so serve others, you are actually blessing them. When you are serving others, you are actually blessing blessing them. So if you're wanting to know purposes for your life, here's the fourth purpose for your life, that God has shaped you to serve Him. He's shaping you to serve Him. He's wired you to be you, but He's shaping you to serve Him. And it's an incredible formula. I'll talk more about it in just a little bit. But Ephesians 2.10, listen to this. It's this week's memory verse. If you're, if you're you know, memorizing Scripture, I promise you it is a huge thing for you to look at Scripture and say, okay, today, that's this week's memory verse. I'm going to remember this one because this is how important it is. Listen to this from Ephesians 2.10. It says, we are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, 
which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We're, we are God's workmanship. Remember I talked, I talked about it in week one? That we are the artwork of God or we are the, um, the, the workmanship or, or you know, we're the, the mold of God. Some of you know, oh boy, he's got two-year-old and a five-year-old, so here comes the Play-Doh, right? Yeah, I brought Legos out for one of the other weeks, now I'm bringing the Play-Doh out. And when we look at Scripture, when we look at um, Isaiah 45, 9, look at this Play-Doh. It's just, you know, oh, it's just so easy to form. And when we understand that, this, that, that the hands of God are shaping us into something and into serve, it makes our life so, so much better. We begin to understand what our purpose is. Isaiah 49, Isaiah 49, 9 says it this way. And if this isn't as blunt as it gets, then, then I don't know what is. It says, what sorrows await those who are you with their creator? Does a clay pot are you with its maker? That's like my boys playing with this Play-Doh on the table. And the Play-Doh comes alive and says, I don't like what you're making me into. First of all, my, my boys would freak out. And then Ty would probably just chunk it across the room and be like, who cares? You're my, I, I am forming you into what I think you should be. And isn't God doing that with us? But all too often we say, God, no. Don't form it. Just, just put me over here as a blob. And I'll try it myself. You see, we, we have a calling to serve. We have a calling to be shaped by God. Now, some of you are saying, I'm not a, no, listen, I'm not a minister. I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not, no, I understand. You're not a pastor. That's what I do. I pastor. But we're all ministers. Because you know those two words are synonymous in the Bible. Serving and a minister. See, but if I told you, hey, you're a minister, you would say, no, you're a minister. I just, I just come to church. And I, I'm in the nursery or set up or whatever. And I would say, no, you're not. I would say, if you say that you serve, then you are a minister. I'm a pastor. But you are a minister. And some of you are bivocational, right? You know, you're bivocational. You're like, oh, well, I already worked somewhere else. Don't call me a minister. That's what you do. And if you call me that, then give me some of your money. Right? That's how you'd feel. No, I would tell you this. You are bivocational. It's kind of like this phrase. If, when you think of bifocals, anybody? I'm not going to ask you who wears bifocals. But bifocals, when you put the bifocals on, what do you, what, aren't, aren't they doing two things? Right? Aren't you getting to see the near, and your, the, the near and the far when you have bifocals on? Let me tell you what you are. You are a bifocal minister. Because you're doing two things. Yes, you're working in your place and you're a minister there, but you also can be serving God by doing that. And there are two things. I love this because when you think about it, you're doing the near now in your work every day. You're like, oh, I could be a minister in my work. I could be, I could be over the, this family as I'm helping you know, deliver their child. I could be over this, this lady in my cubicle who I hear sniffling and crying next to me. And I could just say, are you okay? And that's the near. And then the far is the eternity. And every one of us, right, are ministers of Jesus. See, so when we look at Scripture in Colossians 3.17, and you can see it on the screen, it says, And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So you may be sitting there saying, well, I, what do you mean? What, how can I do that? What, what is it you do? Anything you do. What if you take out the garbage, Reed? What if you take out the garbage? Oh, Mom, i got to take out the garbage. This sucks. i got to take the garbage out. You know, I really got to, oh, watch your sister. you got to watch your sister. Oh, man, God would never have me babysit my sister. What, isn't, isn't that anything? Right? What about that project at work that you didn't, you thought you should have never got that project? You're over that. Come on. That's not in my pay grade to have that project. Or how about this one? How about just changing a dirty diaper? Can you do that for the Lord? Some of you are like, I don't know. I mean, why did he even go there? Here's why I go there. Because we got people in the nursery right now who are 
dirty diapers. And, and moms, they're not calling you in to say, are they? Every time a dirty diaper done, they don't say, hey, hey, Erica, you need to come in and get the dirty diaper. You know, no. They put the kid down and they change the stinky, dirty diaper that's not even their child, their, their baby. Not only that, they sing Jesus loves me over the baby. Is that serving? When I read Colossians 3.17, I think of our nursery workers who are in there right now. Two new ones, Meredith and Jackie, who are in there over dirty diapers, and they're singing Jesus loves me to these babies. You're like, man, is that, that, that's really serving? Well, every night now, I've told it, maybe I did tell you this, I was like, maybe I did, I don't know. I'm over my son, Trey, in his, in his crib, and he wants me to pray with him, and then we sing Jesus loves me. Well, I started singing it to him the other day, thinking he doesn't know what's going on, and he starts rattling it off, singing it to me. And I'm thinking of our nursery workers, who were like, they're just changing diapers. No, they're singing over our children who understand that Jesus loves them at the age of two. Wow. Here's a fact for you this morning that I've just mentioned earlier, but the calling to salvation, when you're hearing this, oh, I'm called to to come and be saved by Christ, is also the call to serve. So this morning, I I know most of you are ready to get out there and have your street tacos and watch the thunder, so I'm going to give you four quick benefits of serving. Okay, I'm going to give you four benefits of serving unselfishly. In your bulletins, there's a place to follow, especially you students who are stayed up too late playing video games. And, you know, I want you to get your bulletins out, grab a pen, follow along. All right. Four of them. All right. We're going to go four of them that if you serve others unselfishly, what will happen in your life? First one is that it will create joy in your life. It will create joy in your life. See, most of the time we look for happiness in different places. We look for happiness in all the wrong places. And let me just list a couple. Possessions, positions, in passions, in pleasures, in popularity. If I just can be popular, then I'll have joy. In our status, in that raise, in that promotion, in that sex, or in that salary, I'll have joy. But I'm here to tell you today that if you want joy in your life, then serve. Because that's what serving does. And there's just secrets to it. The first one, we look at like a secret. What's the secret to to this idea of creating joy? It gets the focus off of yourself. It shifts that focus from being an inward focus to being it's all about me to an outward focus that it's about others. See, our, our society is different, right? Doesn't our society look at it the other way? Isn't that countercultural? Every commercial, I could have listed, a, a, showed you a ton of commercials, and probably a good pastor would and had a great video for you to show. But you just look at commercials, and all of the commercials are about how they'll make you feel better. How it will make you feel like you are, have more pleasure, or you will have more power, or this will take care of you, or it'll make your life better. Every commercial you can turn on. Watch them today when we're watching the Thunder game. I'll keep the commercials on. And you can just watch the commercials will be about you. And then when we look at Scripture, it flips it upside down. That if you want all the pleasure, and you want all the feel-goods, and you want all the joy, then serve someone else. It's countercultural. The more you give your life away, the more joy that you will have. Paul wrote it to the Philippians who were a church similar to us, who were just trying to get along, they're trying to figure all this out. He wrote to them, he says, listen, I want to tell you about my own life. My life is being poured out as a part of the sacrifice and service I offer to God. For your faith, yet I am filled with joy, and I share that joy with all of you. Paul's saying, I'm poured out, I'm serving, I'm sacrificing, and let me just tell you, I'm filled with a joy that I can't even explain. The most helpful people are the happiest people. Think about it in your own, think about people in your own life. The people who you know, you're just like, man, Susie from PTA, man, she just, she's just so helpful. She helps all the time. And, and is she the happiest? You know, oh, 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 Jeff in my office. I mean, he's, he's always just, he's just asking people how their lives are and, and he's serving others and, and he really is the happiest in the office. 
But let's go the other way. Who are the ones who are always the ones who are the jerks? And the ones you, try, don't wanna, you just don't want to be around. Aren't they the ones that are always talking about themselves? Here's a, if you need it in a way that's probably more blunt, look at Philippians 2.4 out of the message. It says, forget yourselves long enough. Just forget yourselves long enough to lend a, hand, a helping hand. I love that out of Philippians 2.4. If you lack joy in your life, start serving. Here's another secret I want to share. If, hey, how about this? If you want joy, use your gifts to help others. Use the gifts that you have to help others. If you're in a job, yeah, you're, you're bivocational, and you know you're good at something, are you helping others do this? Juan Nava is a great example for this for me. He's a mechanic. He knows how to mess with all this stuff. When I, had, I needed like some spark plugs re- redone in my car, and I know you could just take it anywhere and they'll redo them. He was telling me of this special Mexican way that they did it in California of, of actually sealing them far better than any dealership ever would. He says, I put this thing, at that, that, that. and I was like, what are you saying? He's, and, and, and half of it I understood, and half of it didn't. The only part I understood was that it would be better than any other dealership. And he says, I put something in there, and I was like, wow, I'm watching this. And every time I say, Juan, how much is that going to be? And Juan tells me, ah, da, nah, nah, nah. You know, I'm like, no. So, I, you know, I, 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 you know I, and I'm not a cheapskate, so I, you know, I pay him a little bit, and you should too. But he's always that way. He always says, nah, nah, nah. Nah, 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 man, nah, man, you know. And I'm thinking, wow, what an example of somebody with gifts and passions and serves. And, and some of you are sitting here and your car has been fixed. Or maybe your hair has been cut. Or maybe your baby's been watched. Or maybe your house has been moved by others who had passions and gifts to do that. I talked about the pool family yesterday who are probably right now trying to get their life in order in a new house in Glenpool. They live 45 minutes, an hour, I don't know, way out in the middle of nowhere. We're driving all the way to church these last couple months, joined a community group, and that group yesterday spent three or four hours moving them. And I remember talking to Brady and Chain, who are just like, you know, and I was like, that's what they do. They like moving things. They're like, give me box, you know. And so they're moving them, and they're like, oh, it was great, man. We, we got them moved in three hours. It was awesome. Because that's what your gifts are to do. Nobody less than the one who um, I always brag about because I get to work with her constantly is Carrie Stone. And she's just an administrator. She just, you know, it's the the behind the scenes. You know, I don't don't even don't even talk about me or don't even do a video, which she wouldn't do. Um, But and I'm still mad at her about that. But uh, she's just behind the scenes administrating things and doing things. She has great gifts for this, great gifts for this. And you talk about, and you're not paid one dime to do any of this, and just serves. The other day in our group, and I'm probably, I'm breaking the rules, but to hear her explain the joy that she has now from when she was doing things in her life before that uh, she just wasn't getting, feeling happy. She wasn't getting any joy. And she's like, I'm not being paid for this or anything else. I'm just serving the Lord. And I feel a joy in my heart that I haven't felt in years. And that's because she's using her gifts. I can keep going on, our band, who have gifts, and they're sitting up here, and they're singing, and they're playing. And this joy is just happening in their lives. Let's look at the next one, number two. Serving others unselfishly will improve my relationships. Serving others unselfishly will improve our relationships. You're like, okay, Pastor Obvious, I think I already know that. But don't we all need this? Don't we all need to understand this? Because you know what? We are people that say, I want what I want, and I want it now, right? And you want what you want, and you want it now. And try to work a relationship that way, married couples. That I want what I want, and I want it now, and you want what you want, and you want it now. So how do we figure out what we want so we can have it now? Well, husbands, we don't. (laughs) Husbands, we say she wants what she wants, and she needs to get it now. Now, but you know what Scripture says? Something similar to that. That husbands, we are like Christ and we sacrifice for the home. Ladies, keep your elbows out of your husband's ribs. We sacrifice for the home because it will improve the home relationship. And we trust that God will find favor over us in that. Now, in, in just relationships in general, self-centeredness is the root of all relationship problems. 
When you think of any relationship problems that you're having, have had, or things you can look in the future, self-centeredness is the root of those problems. The more you practice unselfishness, the better your relationships would be, young or old. Everybody benefits. So you say, how do I learn it? How do I learn to be unselfish? How do I do that? Again, you copy Jesus. And you're like, copy Jesus, really? I mean, that's what he's going with? Yeah, how about this? Take this back, WWJD. Remember that trend and everybody had them? Everybody's walking around, this is so cool, yeah, WWJD. Well, hey, brainiacs, that's always been in the Bible anyway. And here's where it says, Matthew 20, 28, your attitude must be like my own, for I did not come to, to be served, but to serve. That's Jesus. And if you want to live an unselfish life, then you copy Jesus. Paul said it this way. And you're like, well, Jesus said it. he's God. Can't he, just, that's, can't he just write that? And he's like God, right? Paul wasn't God. And you remember what Paul wrote. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That was boldness, right? Didn't that take guts to say? And I'm saying that to you today. Paul was saying, listen, people don't want to just hear about Christ. People just don't. You, you go into your office tomorrow and start talking about Christ. Yeah, you may get fired, whatever else. And that's fine. I mean, but it's, it's, it's not even practical, though. When you go into your office and you just start talking about Christ, everyone's like, really? How about if you start being like Christ? Doesn't that change everything? And it's not the more you talk about Jesus that matters, it's the more you are like Jesus. Romans 14, 18 says, if you serve Christ in this way, you will please God and you'll be respected by others. You young people walk around your, your hallways and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I got my hair perfect today. I think people are going to think it's cool and like me. No, no, no. That will last for two seconds and half the girls will hate you and some will say it's pretty. Boys, you, you're, you're like, how do I be cool today? If I go up and talk to that girl, maybe she'll think, well, no, no. Or if I, give this, if I go to my boss and I have this perfect idea, maybe my boss will think I'm awesome. If you want to be respected by others, what do you do? You serve. And you become like Christ. Romans 14, 18, if you serve Christ in this way, you will please God and you will be respected by others. What more do you want? Isn't that it? And here's the cool part I want to share with you this morning. The more that you bless and serve others, the more you get blessed. Yeah, it's a sow and reap principle. Don't try to quantify it and be like, okay, if I go and do something nice for them, let me go write this down, God. You need to start working up something nice for me right now. Don't start working that formula out. It doesn't work that way. But if you start unselfishly serving others and being like Christ, you will be respected. Proverbs 11.25 says this, the one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others, they're helped themselves. I love this. It's the reverse Jerry Maguire. That's what I was, when I was reading this. Like, this is the reverse Jerry Maguire. It's not to help me help you. It's help you help me. That's what it is now. I'm going to help you, and at some point, it's going to help me. But I know for some of you may say, I don't have time to do this, man. My business is, it's just, you know, it's just busy. I got to keep figuring out how to work it out. I'm working so much. I'm with this. I don't have time to do these things. And I would say to you, from what I'm reading, you may be forfeiting God's blessing on your business. Maybe saying, I'm working hard because I want to get that raise, man. I ain't got time to come and set up and do these things. I ain't got time to work in the night. I ain't got time to do the divers. I ain't got time to be on the lunch seat. I ain't got time to go and serve at some place. I'm trying to figure this out. And I would say to you, from what I'm reading, that you may be forfeiting God's blessing for you. Proverbs 11, 17 says, you do yourself a favor when you are kind. Proverbs 22, 9 as a generous man will himself be blessed. If you, want a better, if you want better relationships, if you want better business, if you want better networking, if you want better things in your life, then start serving other people. You go into a business. Think of the good businesses you go into. Chick-fil-A, Research. These are places that I just frequent. 
and I just watch the people in there. Don't they want to serve you? Now you're thinking, yeah, because they want to make money or whatever else. Oh, but look at their business. Their business is booming. And they have people in there that seem genuine, that they really want you to know where the bananas are. You know, they're like, really? You care that much about the cheese that I'm looking for? They're like, you really? And you're going to walk me all the way there to do that? Wow. Serving others unselfishly. Wow. Number three. What else will it do? It'll make your life meaningful. I'm not going to spend a ton on this because there's every, every one of you to the person from the back corner to the front are sitting there and you're saying, I want to have meaning in my life. And I don't care where you are in your life, at the worst place, in the middle place, in the best place, you want to have meaning. Young, old, Seth to the back, Jenny to the front, or Kaylee to the front, Jenny to the side, every one of you are saying, yeah, I want to have meaning in my life. I just don't want to be weight on the earth. Well, how do you do that? You serve others unselfishly. Meaning comes from living for something greater than yourself. That's where meaning starts. It, money doesn't bring meaning. And for those of you, if I just said, hey, yeah, who makes this much money in here? Come on, I'll stand up. How rich are you? You would stand up and I'd say, now how many of you get your meaning from that? And you would start sitting down. Go Google it. All the billionaires in the world would tell you money doesn't bring meaning to their life. So for all of you who are thinking, if I just had more money, I would have time to find more meaning. It doesn't come that way. Meaning comes from ministry. It comes from you understanding that you are a minister of the gospel, that you are a server of the gospel. Mark 8.35, Jesus says it this way. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. True life. Paul writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that in your work for the Lord, it's never wasted. It's never wasted. You ever done a project and you were doing it and something happened? The plug on the computer got pulled out? Or the baby walked up and dee, deleted it or whatever? And you're just like, oh my goodness, it's all, that's all gone. It's wasted. Everything I did. Well, Paul was saying, listen, when you serve the Lord unselfishly, that work is never wasted. And if you want meaning in your life, then start serving. Last one, probably for me at least one of the most important. How will people remember you? You will leave a legacy. And again, I think for most of us sitting here today, we want to be a person who's remembered well. We just don't want to have a funeral where some when people start coming and start saying things about us that they didn't even know and, and it just makes people, you know. No, we want people long after we're gone, to remember what a great servant we were. And I believe serving others unselfishly will leave a legacy. It actually will leave two. It will leave you a legacy here on earth, and it will leave you a legacy in eternity. But I want you to think about the people who are most remembered in history. Just think of people who are most remembered. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Mandela, Mother Teresa, when you think of these people, why are they remembered? They're remembers, remembered because they were the greatest servants of our time. Proverbs 10.7 says it like this, good people will be remembered as a blessing. And you have to ask yourself today, what do you want to be remembered for? And will you be remembered at all? Matthew 20, 26, Jesus says, listen, if you want to be a person who's great, you must be the servant of all the others. I've gone to countless ministry conferences on leadership, and you should see these places packed. 25,000 people who want to be leaders in this place. But I've also been invited to the ones 
who teach you about serving. And you should see the 10 or 15 people who sign up for those. Because everybody wants to be a leader, but nobody really wants to serve. If you go to Amazon.com, you can find for every 500 books on leadership, there's one book on serving. But you may sit there and say, but nobody sees my acts of service. Nobody sees that, but if I'm a leader, people will see it and they'll follow that. But God sees your acts of service. It's the same argument when people say, you know, the guy's on the side of the road and he's holding this thing, we'll work for food, whatever else, and you feel like, man, maybe I ought to, maybe I ought to give him a, something today. You know, maybe I ought to give him a, a five. Now, if you're one of those people that gets your, your wallet out, then you start honking your horn so that everybody looks at your car, and then you roll your window down and you're like waving the five in the air and you're like, I want people to see that. That's not how it works. And I know for some of you, you may be saying, well, he's going to take that and go buy some cigarettes and drugs and beer with it. What if the Spirit is just moving you to give? You know who sees that? God sees it. God sees it. And as a pastor, I struggle with this one at times because I try to appreciate. We have, we have almost 75% of our church serving. And I try to say thank you. And I try to appreciate. And I try to say you're doing a great job. And I know these are all the things that our elders, they tell me that I have to, do, have to do, and you better be doing, and telling our people what a great job they're doing. But let me just tell you, if you're serving somewhere, and I can walk back there and tell all these 20-some people who are serving in other places, there's nobody who will appreciate you like God will. And you have to believe that when you're serving. If you're back there serving, you're saying, I'm doing Kenny a, a, a favor, or I'm doing Christy a favor by serving back here, you're missing the boat. Because the reward comes from the Lord. Listen to Hebrews 6.10. It says, God is fair. He will not forget the work you did and the love you showed for him by helping his people, by changing the diaper, by singing Jesus loves me, by putting a curtain up, by taking them chained to the laundromat with your kids and all week washing these and drying these black curtains. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is fair and he will not forget the work you did and the love you showed for him, Chris Roberts by coming every Wednesday and being with these kids and sitting up front with them and being a man that you would want to be, right, Jeremy? Because you wrote his name in Facebook and said, that's the kind of person I want to be. And God is fair, and he will not forget the work you did and the love you showed for him by helping his people. And he will remember that you are still helping them. What great scripture. Now you're saying, well, man, whoa, man, okay, now we're getting to the good part. Because where's God coming into play on all this stuff that I'm doing? Listen to this. Jesus said it this way, that his father will honor anyone who serves me. He says, my father will honor anyone who serves me. You could get the Nobel Peace Prize. You can get the, the Congressional Medal of Honor. You can get all these awards. But there's no greater honor than what Jesus just said, to be honored by the creator of the universe for serving him. I want to tell you today that if you want to leave a legacy, then start serving. The greatest use of life is to invest in that which will outlast it. I love that quote. To invest in something that when you're gone, it will keep going. And how long has the church been here? Not just this church. How long has the church been here? So what's next for you? We ask this question. You're like, all right, well, cool, I'm ready. Like, what, what do I do? And, and I told you, yes, 75%, 70%, Carrie probably has the exact number, 68%, whatever it is, of our church is already going at it. But there's several who just still aren't. But maybe they're serving elsewhere. Yeah, that's fair. I totally understand that. Because here's what I believe, that it starts at home. It starts inside out. Are you serving in your families first? Before you sign up and say, I want to serve in the nursery and, and cook a lunch, I want to ask you, are you serving in your home? And then, are you serving in your church? And then I would say, are you serving in your workplace? Because I know there's opportunities there. Where is it that you can serve God with your passions and be productive for God's kingdom? 
There's all types of put things for you to do at, at SCC. And if you're, if you're saying, okay, I'm ready. I want to I do it. Please come and see us. We will get you connected to God's kingdom so fast your head will be spinning. Meredith Roush last week, young, single, uh, you know, girl, she's like, oh, I want to I, I serve. What can I do? Did we wait for two or three months to figure out, hey, we'll get you in a rotation. We'll figure it out and get you in the rotation. No. I called Katie immediately. I said, let's get Meredith serving immediately because she's passionate and ready now. So she's set up in this room last week. She's set up all around the church. She's in the nursery right now. She's ready. I want to serve. And that's what our church is hoping to do for everyone who wants to be connected to God's kingdom. Nick Smith, I want to brag on you for a minute. 16 or 17 year old boy who week in, week out for the last several weeks has been coming early and sitting back there and learning how to do sound and be trained to do sound for our church. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, right? But Nick's been coming. And this morning I told him, I said, Nick, thanks for getting out of bed and coming. Now he was a little late, so he thought I was being sarcastic, but I wasn't. I was being real. And he's like, dude, I was just in the bathroom. And I'm like, no, I'm being for real. He's like, oh, I thought you were being sarcastic. I was like, God, you young people can't even take a compliment. And I was serious about that. Well, listen, I, I, I hope you heard more today than just a, a sermon. I hope you really heard, you know, what, how can I serve now? What can I do? How can I be a part? So if you're not serving somewhere, please come and see me. I would say, how are you doing in your home? You serving in your home first? Then I would say, let's get you serving in the church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for what has happened today through our worship and honoring you, God, with our, with our time, Father. I pray, Father, that you're pouring back on us a favor and a blessing to our homes, to our jobs, to our relationships, God. Father, I am praying that you have challenged those today who maybe they're serving in a place they're not passionate about. They need to make a change. So God, I'm praying for them. <clears throat> and God, I'm praying for those who are sitting there who just haven't been serving. They felt like just a, a lump of Play-Doh. And they're saying, God, I'm ready for you to shape me, to put me in the right place. So be with them, God. Let us have a great lunch today, God. Thank you so much for Alex and her family who are serving for that. And Father, I'm praying over our tithes and our offerings right now. For those people who, God, are going to be faithful givers today to your church. God, that you find blessing on them, that you open up the, the, the windows and the gates of heaven, Father, for them. You pour out on them. Thank you for those who are faithful, God. Bless those who are giving offerings to things like uh, Alicia and Latvia and the kids going to camp and missions and things like that, God. I pray uh, that that would be used in such a mighty way. So God, we love you and, and just thank you for today. In uh, Jesus' name we pray, amen.